So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. First of all, thanks for joining the session with audience Forrester and Havas Helia. We're excited to have you today. So our speakers are here to shed a new light on customer insights and explore how and why technology advances like artificial intelligence will play an important role in understanding customer insights in the future. Please tweet us at AudienceCo with the hashtag AI for Insights. So I'm delighted now to introduce you to our wonderful speakers that we have today. Uh, so we have Nuria Sadami, uh, the Data and Strategy Insights Director at Habasilia. We've got James McCormick, who is a Principal Analyst at Forrester, focused on digital and customer insights. And we have Javier Baron, CEO and co-founder of Audience. Uh, all of their handles are on the screen at the moment, and you've got the hashtag in the corner as well. So feel free to connect and tweet with them on Twitter as well. Um, and without further ado, let me um, share the presentation with James to take it away. Thank you so much, Cassie. And uh, let me just uh, share my screen uh, quickly. Uh, give us a moment. There we go. And um, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen. And so um, really excited to be joining uh, audience and have us here today uh, with the, the likes of uh, Javier and, and Yura to really uh, you know talk about uh, what Cassie mentioned, which is insights and uh, really why. Uh, and for me today, I'm going to be making the case uh, for insights as a strategic um, kind of initiative or something that can really provide us uh, you know competitive advantage in this age of the customer and you know I'm also going to look at the role of um, artificial intelligence in that whole kind of play and so today um, my presentation is going to be called um, become an insights driven business and surf the wave of digital disruption and so you know, what am I going to talk about so really starting off from the you know the premise that many of us are you know I don't don't have to convince any anyone really that uh, data driven is the way to go in terms of making decisions. We've been doing that as uh, large enterprises and uh, you know, many other kind of organisations for for a while though. But um, in order to really uh, maximise uh, you know the opportunity we have for data and the you know the analytics and the insights that we can generate from us, you know that's not something that we've really been doing. We haven't been maximising it. We haven't been um, uh, kind of insights driven so to speak and so what I'm going to do today is really discuss a link between you know uh, these kind of big concepts such as digital disruption and uh, the need for us to be re tr really and truly insights driven at scale across the organization I'm as part of that I'm going to talk a little bit about what insights driven businesses are at Forrester we have defined what an insights driven business is and um, we're going to discuss why we should be why we should be one, and perhaps maybe why we aren't one as well. So that's uh, that'll be an interesting part of the discussion. Um, I'm then going to go into uh, talk a little bit about digital intelligence, which is really the application of insights and customer insights to you know drive digital engagement, drive digital uh, interactions, and that's where the discussion around artificial intelligence really comes into play because uh, being able to do that at scale. We really do need to uh, leverage the machine to be able to do that, and so that's where uh, we start to make the link there. And what I, I always like to talk about um, examples of firms that are really beating the market through the use of um, insights and insights-driven uh, capabilities through things like uh, you know which they then apply and um, you know generate value from things like in, uh, artificial intelligence. So really quite excited to be, be here today. So um, you know, let's quickly talk about this wave of digital disruption that is upon us at the moment and you know uh, many of our surveys and it won't be of any surprise to you that um, the execs uh, of, of you know these big captains of these large enterprises uh, that are uh, seeking to surf this wave of disruption all know that disruption is coming. They know this wave is coming and you know they believe you know in this particular survey is kind of showing that you know execs believe digital disruption will be uh, will disrupt you know, digital will disrupt their business in the next 12 months. So that's no you know that's no real surprise. But what really is uh, kind of interesting or even challenging is that these many these self same people, um, these kind of leaders of industry, uh, don't really have a clear vision for what um, 
you know, dig, you know, digital really means for the the business, and don't understand how to generate uh, the value from uh, you know this digital disruption. In other words, are they going to be surf? Uh, are they going to uh, surf this wave of digital disruption, or are they going to you know be dumped by it and um, you know, be cast aside as uh, kind of uh, enterprises? And so that is the the, the real challenge that we have today. Um, you know, uh, many uh, other ways we've asked and, and sought responses from these kind of uh, this digital disruptions that we know, for instance, that um, you know, uh, execs know that the, their businesses will not be um, anything like they are today in 2020. Now, given that we coming to the end of 2016, that's just uh, just over three three years from now. And now, these execs believe their businesses won't be anything like they are. Uh, then in three years' time, and so it's pretty scary when they actually don't know, um, you know, what to do and how to uh, go about it. So, you know, we totally believe uh, at Forest and we kind of see that borne out in our research that uh, to to be able to compete and surf this wave of digital disruption, we really need to be good at um, you know uh, changing data and and uh, using data and turning that into action. Why? Because digital really represents an opportunity, and also a challenge, by the way, to instrument the interactions that we have with our customers and across the business, actually, uh, for you know collecting data really about that interaction, about that uh, you know the the impact of those decisions, and um, then being able to you know generate insights from that, and then being able to uh, secondly, because it's a digital interaction, be able to apply uh, or to change that interaction or influence in some kind of way because of that data. So we have a lot of uh, data and um, you know which will be able to uh, if we're really good at uh, being insights driven uh, to be able to drive into a lot of actions and certainly inform actions at scale. And um, you know the great thing is that most of us all three quarters of us really um, aspire to be data driven so we all kind of realize that we want to uh, be data driven. But again, there's this kind of gap, right, where uh, less than a, f uh, a third of, of firms are really feel, and this is self-reporting, they don't believe that they're good at turning data into action. And certainly, my experience in speaking to uh, you know firms and leaders, uh, you know, week in, week out, and you know, looking at their businesses under a, a microscope, that, that is uh, definitely true. We're not really good at that, and, that, and it, there's a, a definite gap or disconnect between the data we collect and the potential data we collect uh, you know, to drive uh, actions and that's where um, you know, uh, we are going to suffer if this, in this digital disruption wave is going to come upon us. If we're not good at doing this, then we're not going to surf it. Um, and so at Forrester, we firmly believe that uh, we need systems and you know, that's technology and our process and the people in place that are able to tightly integrate the uh, engagements that we have with our customers, or these systems of engagement, uh, or touch points, with the insights uh, that we gather about those uh, those engagements, so that our systems of engagement need to be really tight, uh, tightly integrated with our systems of insight, and they should be almost one and the same thing. And uh, you know, in order for us to uh, surf this wave of digital disruption, and at Forrester, we believe that you know firms that do this well are what we call insights driven. Businesses, and uh, so what is an insights-driven business? It sounds all very um, parochial, if, if I'm honest with you. It's not an exciting term, but you know, because many of us believe that we are, and many. And so let's read this definition in front of us. It's an insights-driven business harnesses and applies data and analytics at every opportunity to differentiate its products and customer experiences. So let's, you know, many of us might feel that we are. In fact, I, I certainly believe that most of us harness and apply data and analytics. You know, there's no, uh, there's absolutely no doubt that we, we do. Um, but do we do that at every opportunity to differentiate our products and customer experiences? Do we have a strategy around doing that second part of that sentence? And do we actually do that? And that is really what differentiates insights-driven businesses really from the rest of us, and so part of the reason why uh, you know we are not insights-driven businesses, or most of us really aren't insights-driven businesses, is because the whole ROI discussion around um, the technologies, the processes, the investment we need to make in 
um, uh, data and insights to drive particular functions has really largely failed in, in terms of uh, applying or being able to drive a, strat a strategic corporate in initiative around this. If you take a, you know, for instance, the, the world that I, I work within, digital analytics system, or you know, that can drive, for instance, uh, behavioral targeting for marketing, or drive uh, you know, product optimization, uh, et cetera. They're all very much ROI focused. And um, you know, which an ROI is by their very definition are really specific business value driven and, and by their you know thereby kind of creating these kind of silos of insights that really where where insights is applied. So you might for instance apply great to acquisition marketing, but then maybe fail at the you know, the mid funnel or you know uh, or using insights to drive better customer service or even you know deliver products, right? And so um, for me, uh, ROIs are you know, I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing that, but we should. Uh, we need a more strategic language to really talk about insights so that we can drive it across the enterprise. We need a language for our CEOs to understand, to understand, to understand the real value. And so, at Forrester, we've tried to do that, and we've uh, recently released this report, Insights-Driven Businesses, uh, about insights-driven businesses, and whereby. What we did was we um, we you know, we analysed um, you know startups uh, insights driven startups so startup uh, firms that were VC funded uh, we kind of looked at uh, sources like PitchBook for instance and we looked at the the revenues of these insights driven businesses uh, that were also startups and um, we tracked their yeah you know, we looked at their growth uh, today and also to 2020 and you know with a 40% compound annual growth rate you know we're looking at about a quarter of a trillion that these specifically these these small startups you know this is what they're going to grow to in 2020 and that you know that's really interesting okay but it really gets interesting when you then look at publicly traded firms so large uh, incumbent firms that are really um, that we felt were um, insights driven when we really looked at it, and there was 40 of them, right? When we when we really looked at uh, sources such as Morningstar, and we looked at the firms that were listed in those publicly traded um, listings, and uh, we kind of looked at what their growth rate was going to be. We calculated using standard uh, formula, and you know they are growing at about 27% compound annual growth rate. So that means that as as an overall um, kind of revenue generation capability, insights driven businesses will be generating 1.2 trillion dollars uh, uh, in revenue by 2020. Now the question you need to ask your um, CEO is whether she or he wants to be part of that 1.2 trillion or wants to be part of be left behind um, with the you know, glo uh, you know the, the global GDP which is around 3.5 percent annually annually. So I'm not saying that this is the complete discussion, but the, this is the kind of language that we need to use in order to uh, really drive, um, you know, strategy and to really deliver competitive advantage. And when you look at some of these insights-driven uh, businesses, which we will talk about um, very um, soon, you will see that they do have a strategy around being insights-driven, and um, they do have that executive sponsorship. So. You know, so let's talk a little bit about the this digital intelligence practice that I've talked about, which is really the application of insights and being insights driven around customer engagement, and look at um, what we need to really succeed. Well, first of all, we need a strategy, and we need a strategy at a um, at a corporate level, uh, supported by the exec team. To really be able to uh, to drive uh, you know competitive advantage, and that's kind of where we fail almost immediately. Is that many of us, you know, if you go speak to your chief operating officer or even your CMO, and never mind the CEO, and you ask, do you have a strategy around engaging with customers that is seeking to leverage data and analytics to drive you know better experiences for them, so that we can gain competitive advantage? Okay, that's a little bit wordy, but you, you get what I mean. And most of them, when you ask them, say, "Yeah, yeah, we'll speak to you know my CMO, or we'll speak to you know head of analytics," and um, you know so that's their kind of nod to it. But is it really a strategy? Do they really, for instance, um, have an organisation or an ownership structure uh, that uh, enables the processes and has the people and skills to really, and and the culture, by the way, to really drive um, 
you know, insight, be insights driven when it comes to customer engagement? Are we collecting the right metrics on, and, the, and, and, and uh, the right KPIs? Do we even know what success looks like at our digital touch points? So are we actually measuring success there? And as our, does our strategy really support it? You know, and then there's the technical approach and whether, you know, the way that we think about optimization, which I'm going to talk about now. Um, so let's quickly deep dive into the, you know, the technical architecture that we need to be thinking about in the strategy that, uh, that I'm talking about. And, you know, we don't need to be too, um, you know, uh, sciencey about the whole thing. It's pretty simple. We just need data uh, management capabilities to manage our digital um, data that we get. We need analytics uh, to be able to generate the insights that we need um, wherever we need them. And we need an optimization uh, capabilities to be able to then apply these insights at scale to optimize uh, whatever we're doing, whether it's marketing, you know, product development, um, you know, customer support, you name it. And these systems really need to work very closely and be tightly integrated with each other. Um, and be a, and you know, data and information needs to flow very tightly between them in a in a very tight loop um, kind of way. Now, because it's digital intelligence, because it's insights for um, customer engagement that really needs to be highly integrated and um, and needs to be able to keep up with those fleeting moments that we have with our customers. Actually at Forrester we track 15 different uh, digital intelligence technologies that uh, that we kind of really need and very few of us um, have um, even half of these technologies to really uh, be able to you know, leverage insights to uh, be able to engage with customers at scale to, to, to receive competitive advantage. Anyway, so that's the, the technology side of things. So we just need to think about the uh, available capabilities that there are out there. Uh, we need to be uh, audit where um, you know, uh, there, there are gaps in terms of uh, the insights, the data, and the optimization capabilities, and, and have a, a clear roadmap that seeks to fill those gaps as well. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, this kind of concept of continuous optimization. So many of us do indeed use data and analytics in some way to optimize, say, media spend, to optimize um, you know, page search, to optimize mid-funnel conversions, to optimize uh, the way that our app is uh, configured and uh, the way that our developers build experiences with them, et cetera, et cetera. But do we do this uh, continuously at every opportunity? Do we leverage every customer interaction that we have across all of our digital touch points? And do we use uh, that, that, that interaction to collect information about our customer and the moments of engagement so that we can evolve, evolve the understanding we have our customers during these moments of engagement, and then do we then change the way that we engage with customers or the way that the system reacts in order to do that? And then do we test it again, and do we do this continuously at scale uh, in order to gain that competitive advantage? Well, the answer is not. We don't do that at scale. Uh, we, we're not doing this at scale. Very simple concept, and believe me, it is a simple concept, but we are not consciously thinking about it in this kind of way. But if we do, you know, then we can take steps to iteratively um, you know, uh, grow our insights and grow our digital intelligence and grow our ability to continually optimize across the entire organization, thereby gaining competitive advantage. If you think that this is just some kind of scientific uh, science fiction future, uh, think again. I mean, you just need to look at companies such as Stitch Fix that leverage um, machine learning and, um, and, and it's kind of an uh, artificial intelligence kind of way to, uh, to continually optimize the engagements that they have with their customers. So let me explain. So Stitch Fix, for those of you who don't know, is an American-based um, uh, fashion retailer, online fashion retailer. And what they do is they sell fashion. And let me explain a little bit more. So as a customer of Stitch Fix, Stitch Fix what you do is you, um, you sign up and you give your preferences about what kind of uh, fashion uh, items you like, what you aspire to be, are you professional, do you uh, want holiday apparel or whatever it might be, and you feed that back in, in, in terms of the, the preferences that you want and when you sign up. And then every so often, every month, every three months, a stylist sends you a box of about five or six fashion items. And the, uh, the uh, you know, model of the business is that the you as the customer can return all items uh, free of charge and at no cost to you. And so it really is uh, important for that stylist to get 
the uh, you know those items right and to be able to really understand you and, and understand the, the mood of the market etc so what they do is they've linked the stylus to a continuous uh, continuously optimizing algorithm a machine that enables that stylus to not only plug in the preferences of the um, of the customer that they're looking to serve but also understand because uh, what from the historical interactions what um, you know what to help them, you know, target the the right kind of set of clothing, etc., at that particular persona, and that algorithm continuously learns. It continuously gets feedback from all these interactions, uh, you know, the behaviors that customers exhibit on 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 the website, kind of what they're looking at, uh, their decisions that they they make when it comes to keeping or returning clothes, looking at their preferences, aggregating that up as well, and continuously learning. To then um, be able to improve on that uh, that KPI, which is obviously retention of clothing items, right, or fashion items. Now, the interesting thing here is that this really started off as a digital intelligence play. In other words, being able to uh, help better uh, digital engagement with the customer and obviously, you know, the overall uh, the firm's KPIs. But then the procurement team, uh, so the team within Stitch Fix that. Um, Looks to keep their their stock levels at a, at the right level so that they can service their customers, uh, you know, according to the SLAs that, that were agreed. And what they kind of tapped into this algorithm to really help them understand what stock items they should have and how much they should have at any particular time, thereby actually reducing the cost of um, stock um, to one of the lowest in the industries, according to actually Eric Colson is the uh, chief algorithmic uh, officer that we we spoke to at Stitchfix. And so it had a in this particular instance it, it not only you know been obsessed with customer and understanding customer not only drove better kind of revenues but also reduced uh, significantly reduced cost as well so really kind of interesting um, uh, kind of take on an insights driven business so a firm that really gets a competitive advantage around that there's a few others I just want to mention uh, so there's a company called Ernest a, a student loan company. Uh, and what they do is they measure up to um, 100,000 uh, data points um, for each you know, student that's, that seeks, uh, that looks for a loan and you know, eventually becomes a customer. And uh, they feed this into a continuous optimization engine to impro improve the loan decisions of the loan officer, right? So it's still machine human working together. Um, and so what they're really good at doing is uh, offering loans to students that their competitors won't because, you know, for instance, their competitors will look at, um, you know, credit rating agencies and look at data there. Now, I don't know if you guys were like me as an 18-year-old student, but I didn't have much of a credit history. And so they are able to then you know, better service, uh, you know, those those students because they, they gather behavioral information, social information, and up to 100,000 data points, uh, which on each individual, that which really helps them. And what they're also really good at doing is reducing costs. They, they, they happen to avoid students that um, their competitors might, through their, you know, the standard way of uh, gauging risk, uh, have provided a loan, which, which, but which their, you know, their risk models through this continuous optimization engine has told them not to loan to. So again, a double whammy. Tesla, let's talk a little bit about Tesla. So what they do is they stream performance data from their vehicles uh, continuously uh, to help them then uh, optimize the software and, and the way that the, the machine runs and how to kind of configure that machine. And then they download the latest configuration, the latest version of software over the air, which they then test and analyze again, thereby continually optimizing that product. Alaska Airlines, I like them because it's a fairly simple yet powerful way of continuous optimization. All they did really was instrument their aircraft doors to record, you know, when they were open and when they were closed so that you had um, and, and, and that was reported back. So the COO meets on a weekly basis with the senior team to review the scheduling and, and how well they've done and, and you know, where the, the areas and the issues are, and thereby taking actions to uh, optimize, uh, continually optimize and improve the processes and uh, improve their on-time arrivals. And as a result, they've moved for the region anyway from the best, from sorry, the worst when it comes to on-time arrivals to, to the best in that particular region. When it comes to uh, you know the Washington Post, you know their you know one of their uh, their goals, of course, is to beat their competitors when it comes to being able to deliver value to their advertiser when it comes to their digital site. And we spoke to um, 
a chap called Dr. Sam Hun, who's uh, director of uh, personalization and big data there. And uh, what they do is they continually uh, monitor the, the you know the clicks on ads on their websites and, uh, versus the types of customers that are doing that uh, that are clicking on those ads, and they are continually uh, improving their relevance. What they call what he called their relevance engine uh, to then improve um, their KPIs such as uh, response rates, click through rates, etc. So very much like that. And then lastly, is actually this is my my favourite is there's a Danish uh, football club. Uh, called Mitchelland. Um Apologies to the the Danes on the call. Whether let's see if I got that uh, pronunciation right, but they rose up from nowhere uh, a, f a few years back to uh, actually beat Man United in the first leg of the Championship League last year. And um, the interesting interesting thing is how you know this this tiny team, which is basically a hundredth the size in terms of capital investment and revenue than Man United. How did they beat them in the at least the first leg? They lost the second leg, by the way. The answer is that Matthew uh, Bennon, uh, who uh, bought the club, uh, bought a majority share in the club, um, and Matthew, he comes from Smart Odds, which is an online betting company, which is obviously very, that these companies are very insights driven. And what he did was he insisted that the, the club apply data analytics and continuous learning at every opportunity, you know, for kicking, uh, you know, for kicking coaching, for half-time team talks, for set-piece players and player selection, thereby being able to leverage existing assets uh, to their maximum and to, to gain that competitive advantage. So you can see that it's not just um, you know the Amazons of the world, the Netflixes of the world, etc., that are gaining competitive advantage with insights. These are real companies, um, incumbent companies, some of them that are really making um, strides when it comes to becoming um, uh, when it comes to being insights driven. And so I want to end off my part of the discussion with just some uh, a little bit of a, a thought about you know, what is driving insights and just the, the statement that really 2017 is the year of the insights revolution. So why do we say that uh, at, at Forrester? Why do we think um, uh, insights is the year of the insights, uh, sorry, 2017 is the year of the insights revolution? And really it comes down to, it really tracks very closely to the investment in um, artificial intelligence that we are seeing. So our research um, for this year has really shown us that you know the current investment, so uh, you know ten percent of large enterprises, uh, that, you know this year have are spending on artificial intelligence. Next year we expect that to be around the forty-five percent mark. So that's huge. That's a you know over three four hundred percent increase in uh, in in firm number of firms that are actually spending or enterprises that are spending on this space, and that tracks actually very closely to some of our other data when it comes to the democratization of insights. So for instance, we know that you know, we've seen a steady trend last year and this year of an increase in these business decision makers who feel that they are unencumbered, un unencumbered when it comes to access to these valuable insights to help them make their decisions. We believe that due to th things like artificial intelligence that that will increase to two-thirds um, this uh, uh, next year, 2017. And so why, why is that the case? Why do we think that, that is the case? Well, as we kind of mentioned up front, you know, the man mantra that many of us have had is to try and close the gap from insights to action. And uh, we firmly believe, and we've seen this, that uh, artificial intelligence and you know, technologies around this can en enable this um, by providing faster, more precise decision-making capabilities based on sophisticated anal analytics and putting that in the hands of the business decision uh, maker, so that non-specialist. And you know, how how does this happen? Well, through investments, uh, through things like machine learning, which will drive and automate, uh, you know, things like continuous optimization, you know, predictive analytics that will inform proactive business decision making um, in, in in ways that were you know at scale that have never been achieved before. And you know, lastly, through things like natural language processing, which will allow the business professional to readily communicate you know, queries to the machine, which will then be able to um, you know, do its sophisticated uh, analytics and mathematics, and that feed that back in a way that the, that is relevant to the business. And so that's why we think there is a um, you know a big link between 
artificial intelligence and the growth and adoption and things like the, the, the insights revolution that we are witnessing and we will continue uh, to witness um, you know, next year. So um, I just want to end off by just reminding us that uh, you know, a top-down artificial intelligence and insights uh, support is needed to really deliver uh, and to be able to surf this wave of digital transformation. We should um, learn from the execs of Stitch Fix, uh, Alaska Airlines, Mitchell Hunt and a few others that show that real support does bring competitive advantage through you know, delivering this kind of thing at scale across the enterprise. And we see that these same executives, these same firms are investing heavily in other senior uh, execs such as chief, da uh, chief data officers, which for the first time this, this year, um, well, well, the first time next year will become the majority. So we know that 51% um, of large enterprises will actually have a chief data officer. Uh, for the first time in, in history, they'll, they'll become the, the, the small, small majority. And then, um, you know, insights-driven strategies supporting digital transformation are really set to, uh, you know, set to increase um, uh, in terms of adoption. So it won't be just those 5% uh, of um, you know, high performers that are going to be adopting that now. We're going to see that uh, spread across uh, many uh, kind of incumbent large enterprises going forward, and that will be gaining um, you know, competitive advantage. And largely, this will be able, enabled by uh, you know, things like artificial intelligence. So I'm going to uh, end my, this, this part of the discussion off with a big thank you, and um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Havas Helia to um, uh, to the folks there to, to talk about that. So, uh, yep, over to you guys, um, Javier and then Iria. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, James. Uh, those examples were truly amazing. Um, actually, I'm going to take advantage of uh, my position here and ask you, although we have uh, later questions, I wanted to ask you um, if there are any specific industries that you see that they are succe succeeding the most. Yeah, sure. Well, it's quite kind of if you really look at from a spend perspective, when it comes to you know, uh, it's the way to look at it can be quite complex. But if you look at it from a digital intelligence perspective, which really applies those insights and those kind of elements of artificial intelligence, you can really you know, for for quite a few years now, it's been you know, retail or online retail. Uh, uh, probably no surprise has been the biggest spender. We've then looked at, uh, you know, then travel and leisure have been the second biggest spender. This is overall spend, right? And, uh, you know, then financial services and insurance and it kind of tails off pretty quickly over there. Now, the interesting thing is, is that um, financial services and insurance, they are perhaps the, the fastest growing um, yeah. sector. So whilst they might be the third, third biggest spenders, they are growing the fastest. And I've kind of seen that in the last 18 months has been this kind of liberation of um, yeah, insights teams to be able to apply, particularly customer insights, to um, acquiring and retaining um, customers. And that's because we be they've become better at distinguishing between different types of customer data and being able to manage um, you know, what's really PII sensitive, what's not, et cetera, and being able to then um, have systems that kind of uh, can separate out the use of those particular types of data. So, yeah. Quite interesting. Sorry, a long, uh, heavy, a long uh, response to your question, but hopefully a bit off. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. So, uh, um, uh, Nuria and I uh, will be covering how artificial intelligence is transforming the customer insight re um, revolution. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, just uh, let me address how audience uh, fits into this. So. Uh, we at uh, an audience were able to deliver powerful consumer insights for our uh, clients, and we uh, we do that with uh, with the use of artificial intelligence and cognitive computing systems. So we have worked uh, with Havas Helia on a pilot for a top FMCG brand, um, where we have been able to apply these insights to optimize many areas of their business. Uh, but before I get into that, uh, let me give you um, a little bit of background. Um, so uh, we know that every brand uh, in the world wants to know about their consumers. Uh, they have goals to improve marketing, uh, campaigns, messaging, 
and as well they need to devise a new products or make their current products better. Uh, they as well need to open up new markets and uh, for all of that understanding their consumers uh, is crucial. So on one side we have um, uh, a traditional tool that you use to understand those consumers that are personas, right, that was created to efficiently communicate across a company and all its different departments what market research could uh, determine about their, their consumers. And depending on the goal, if, it's, uh, if it is more a strategic goal or more tactical goal, we may need um, internal first party data like transactional data uh, to create particular campaigns, to, to target particular coupons and offers based on time, or external data if we are, uh, for example, creating a new product uh, or doing market sizing, we used to we used to use uh, we traditional market research techniques such as surveys um, or, or focus groups. Um, on the other side, we have social media that um, I think all, we all agree that has changed uh, many of the dynamics of marketing. Right, introducing real-time marketing when Oreo uh, own the Super Bowl with uh, one single tweet. Um, but the generation of all that data, um, uh, all those tweets, all those posts in different um, social media networks, um, uh, definitely is creating another disruption, right? And that's the social data by itself or more powerful even the combination between that social data with first party data, transactional data, is playing a very important role in both strategic persona creation, so understanding better your, cost, uh, your consumers uh, and, and complementing those market, traditional marketed research techniques, but also on the tactical side. Um, so I have a question uh, for you, Nuria. Uh, in your experience, um, how have you seen social data in combination with other sources complementing each of these quadrants? Uh, thanks, Javier. Um, well, you know, if we think from a strategic perspective, like, you know, brands, I mean, you can better understand not just your audience, if you think you can understand everyone's audience, which is like, you know, um, really amazing. You can look at, like, you know, how everyone is engaging with them, um, like in social, but not only that, you can see as well, like the types of relationships that they have between them. You can know now their personalities because they are public and, you know, also you can understand like behaviors of people. Um, so we can observe all these from like, you know, and we can basically like generate tons of information. Like there is a large amount of data that is sitting up outside there. With that, you know, the possibilities are endless. You can create custom audience, you can create lookalike audiences. And by combining all these data points with like, you know, other first party data or like third party data, you end up with like, you know, a plethora of data points that, you know, basically providing you lots of signals that you can use to fine tune your strategy. I mean, if, if you think like, you know, the, the other advantage is not that you can like, you know, monitor all that over time. So that's, I think, one of the beauty of social data that, you know, is tangible. Um, you can monitor over time. So it means that you can go back to an audience and see how, like, you know, this um, audience is evolving. Whereas, like, you know, with traditional techniques, that's a bit more difficult, but not even difficult. That can be, like, you know, costly. So in reality, there is a real game changer for marketers, like, you know, and how they go about segmentation. We have seen these in the company I work with, uh, with uh, companies that they were looking at traditional types of segmentation, and now we're looking at other types of segmentations more based on the needs that the consumer, like, you know, they have. So try to imagine for a second, for brands where the ultimate goal is to reach masses of people, social data provides like you know an excellent source for data mining i mean you can go outside there and you can find lots of people to reach you just need to be smart with data to understand where to find those people um 
And the other thing is like, you know, um, that you can quantify so social data like you know uh, you know is something that you can you are going to be able to like quantify so it has like you know a statistic like you know a significance opposed to like you know social um sorry focus groups for instance so it means that once you apply you know um your hypothesis you can apply and then you can target these people like you know with advertisement or you can do lots of different things i couldn't agree more with james that you know it's all about like action data it's not about producing insights i think the beauty of social data is um about that is about like you know that you can action the data you can know like people's like you know preferences in channels so that helps a lot can help a lot a brand um, so, like, you know, there's lots of things, like, you know, I mean, I, th I think I've already mentioned a few of them, so, but I will summarize, so it's like, you know, you can just monitor over time, it gives you, like, an instant glimpse into, like, insights, it's a great source, like, for data mining, and, like, for me, the, the, the big thing is it's actionable, I will agree with James, it's like, you know, that you can turn things into action. Thank you, Nuria. Yeah. I think that I mean the, this attitude model clearly highlight why social data is playing such a key role in the transformation of consumer insights. Uh, because it begins with social data and then comes with the ability to have a perfect understanding of the market almost uh, in real time. So the digital data, why for you uh, we think is so important when it comes to updating our approach to a strategic, not only customer, but also consumer insights? I mean, like, you know, there is different things. Um, so for me, the, the first thing is com if we compare to traditional market research techniques, like, you know, I think provides like more, like, you know, tangible ways to action the data. Um, the other thing is unfiltered. Um, so it takes like a very unfiltered approach opposed to traditional like, you know, uh, techniques. There is no human intervention. We have seen that working with brands where the clients, they have their own segmentations. We go into social data and then we challenge back the brand or the client saying, okay, hold a second, we found like completely different types of audiences that, you know, they, they were unaware that they exist there. Um, so that's like, you know, the good thing. Another thing that for me is key is the scalability. So if you think like, you know, traditional techniques, if you want to probably uh, find insights in completely different markets, that social data will allow you to that. We have been working like, you know, with brands that one of the things that we found is using social data is scalable. You can do something in Turkey, but the next day you will be able to use the, me the same methodology, like let's say in, in France. So that's uh, a great deal. And then um, what results is like, you know, you can keep the cost down and you can be quite agile, which is key like now with like, you know, uh, digital transformation to be able to be quite agile. So, yeah, I will say the opportunities are endless, like, you know, we've seen it here in the company. We are using them every day. Um, and if you think, like, if the, like all the social data that can be merged with, you know, historical data that you have, previous, like, audiences, you can merge that with marketing activities as campaigns, brand communications, is huge, the potential. Thank you very much, Nuria. Uh, in the following slide, I wanted to highlight some of those opportunities. Um, so here um, we can see uh, some of those dimensions that uh, digital and social data provides to the consumer insights equation. So the vast amount of data available from social and digital channels give us the opportunity to process and apply this information in new ways using artificial intelligence. Um, here I would like to highlight some of those. So, for example, using um, using psycholinguistics, we are able to see, we are able to know um, how a particular audience engage with the world. What are their their uh, their personality traits, or what are the motivating factors that make them uh, make a decision, purchase a product, or click in your in your CTA. But also understand the online habits, or how do you, how are they connected. Um, beyond what they love, 
but also uh, bringing new dimensions of uh, of um, of, under, of affinities like consumer preferences in terms of readings, in terms of health uh, and diet, or in terms of type of cars or uh, spending habits. So I completely agree that uh, as well with James and uh, with you that uh, that is scalability uh, to be able to move from actionable analytics to insights that automatically derive actions um, is uh, artificial intelligence is the crucial part. Um, so um, that's that's kind of one of the important things. And um, and and Nuria, we have worked together for a FMG uh, FNCG client to better understand uh, consumer segments, different consumer segments. How um, uh, how Askelia and cognitive computing enhanced insights. Uh, uh, and how that client was benefited from, from those. In Adhava Syria, we are starting to use more and more artificial intelligence for many applications. We start to discover that has loads of applications also because like some of the clients we work with, they already have like, you know, they, they have their own data. Um, but one of the m main applications that we found interesting in this particular project was to cross-check audiences with what we call uh, consumer attributes. And I mean by these, like, you know, key drivers for consumption, like, you know, such as spend or price. So let me put you an example. For instance, if you go to, like, a client's database, like, you know, uh, they will communicate with, like, you know, the consumer base, like, um, providing discounts. So one thing, like, you know, that we did is we determined, like, a price elasticity using, like, artificial intelligence. So we were able like to map like you know the um, how sensitive like they were like all these different audiences like you know to price, and you will be surprised because a lot of companies like you know probably 70% of people that they have in the database they start to give them discounts and there is not such a need. So once you start to use data and start to use artificial intelligence you understand that, you know, the company can do, like, some great savings because not everyone, like, you know, is receptive to, like, a discount or, like, to a voucher. Uh, is not, I mean, more importantly, if you are someone who you are not receptive to discounts and the brand is constantly, like, imagine you're a retailer and receiving, like, you know, discounts for a jumper, you will alienate the consumer. So I think in that case, like, artificial intelligence is great because, like, provides that scale and, like, you know, it's able to learn. Um, so that's, like, you know, something like that, which is, like, a, just, like, a use case of how we use artificial intelligence is, like, you know, f can have a massive impact on, like, the results of a company. Thank you very much. Yeah, processing and understanding all all that data, no, is the is the duty of those cognitive systems and artificial intelligence. And in the following slide, I wanted to uh, put just uh, an example uh, with um, a famous brand, Evian, about how consumer insights uh, can uh, uh, can help. No, some of the dimensions that are bringing to that equation. In this case, network science, for example, is we see the the, the network at the left. We are able to determine uh, what customer segments by looking at the density of the engagement. And in this case, we can see do-it-yourself lovers, uh, extroverted marketeers, comedy and foodie fans, and cosmetics fanatics. So already technology is giving up that approach to be data inside data driven to, to understand better my consumer segmentation. But then when we want to understand more one of those segments, then we are able, for example, to say that they are majority women and they are between 25 and 49 years old because we are using, uh, because of the use of um, visual recognition and looking at the profile of images. Um, then as well, by using uh, artificial intelligence and NLP uh, with another uh, discipline that is psychology, and in this case psycholinguistics, we are able to, uh, uh, to, to, to know that they have a, greater inclination for pro-environmental uh, behavior, or they have a preference for low-fat food or for low-emission vehicles. Um, we also know that uh, they love the great British Bake Off and the X Factors, 
uh, that the 90% of that segment are online on Sunday evenings, and that apart from cosmetics, um, they love comedy uh, and cookbooks uh, more than the average UK individual. And machine learning, um, psycholinguistic, visual recognition, and network science, in this case, um, have been the, 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 the disciplines that alongside um, uh, be between them we are able to extract this kind of uh, this kind of insight. So as you can see there are many layers of information that can become an important insight that uh, can become that strategic advantage uh, to, to our competitors. So I know Nuria that in uh, Havas Hilia uh, you, ha you guys have a very good approach to quantify this value. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about that? I mean, one of the things is like, you know, marketers, we might feel paralyzed by the lack of um, like perfect consumer data. People, um, you know, I quite enjoy like um, um, James' slides because you feel a bit paralyzed of taking any action because you're expecting like the perfect consumer data to just to arrive. But there are many opportunities to fill in the gaps in the meantime. You can use like thir third party data sets. Like, you know, and you can start to execute some level of personalization, like an initiatives with artificial intelligence. Um, in terms of like the value for me, there is like three aspects that, you know, um, they need to be in place. Um, and some of them, they are like around the idea. I think I agree with James, like, you know, with his statistics about 73% of like people, the aspiration is to be like a data driven organization, but the reality is completely different. 29% like, you know, of them, they are just turning like, you know, they're starting to turn data into action. So for me, there is three key components to deliver value. And one is that you need to marry the technology, like, you know, the analytics and the strategy. Um, in, like, you know, in my company, um, is like, you know, we have been in meetings that some clients, um, they have the technology, so they have done a large investment in technology, and they're thinking that because they have the technology in place, you know, that the problem is resolved, and, you know, they are able to deliver value already and that's not the case. Some others, they have the analytic capabilities, but they don't have the technology. Um, so again, I think is like, you know, in order to deliver like, you know, uh, that value, you need to have all of three working together. Excellent, so thank you very much, Nuria. So I'm gonna uh, finish with three uh, key uh, takeaways. One of them is, I think, we know the importance of that social data, right? As when we use it by itself, or even more, uh, more powerful, when we use it in combination with first-party data, with that internal data to gather consumer, customer insights, um, that important is because it's updated, so it's, you can see even real time things that are happening, but also you can go historically, so it's very flexible. Uh, that also helps to be very efficient and more agile and, and obviously uh, much costly effective than traditional market research techniques. Um, and it's not only to unlock new opportunities with current customers, but also a deeper understanding uh, of, of consumers. Uh, the second uh, takeaway is uh, how artificial intelligence is making sense of all that data in a completely new way. Uh, extracting, extracting age or affinities toward brands by usual by using visual recognition or extracting personality traits uh, or consuming or consumers motivating factors. Um, the third one is as well, we are not saying about forgetting about the ROI. We are not saying that. However, to have this strategic, uh, um, to, to, to make that strategic decision to become an insight driven business, um, there are things that we need to uh, not be able to quantify, but at some point uh, say that there is that data, uh, extracting insight from that data sometimes can, or, 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 that, or, or basically Estalice is telling us that uh, that data can deliver uh, new ways to, to deliver much more ROI, right? And, and that's kind of the, the debate, an interesting debate that James uh, was proposing. So. Um, actually, Nuria, I have one, one question for you because I know Havas uh, predicted correctly 
the results of the U.S. election by using uh, IBM Watson cognitive system. Uh, can you tell me more a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that is like, you know, the example I just um, mentioned a few minutes ago. So, I mean, what we did wasn't anything exceptional. Um, well, it was exceptional because we predicted who won the elections. But um, basically what happens, um, I mean, the technology is outside there. We had people that they had even better technology that we have. Um, a lot of people, they have, like, you know, they have done predictions with, um, like, data scientists, which, again, again, is having, like, you know, the three, marrying the three disciplines. I think what was good for us to predict the results of the um, presidential elections in the U.S. is that we have, like, you know, the right technology, but we married that, like, with, you know, with analysts. So we were able to, like, you know, just make sense of the data. Um, like we published some dashboards that we were already, like, you know, with ITV saying to them, look, we already see from social data that Trump is more like personable, like, you know, uh, again, applying like, you know, personality traits, we could see that. And I remember the ITV presenter, presenter challenging back and say, well, I don't think Trump is that personable, like, but that's the thing, it didn't lie, like what people, we captured the essence of what people they were saying and what was the intention and a different thing, what was like what the polls were saying, what like, you know, uh, the media was trying to say, we captured the essence. So I think it's very powerful, like, you know, social data. I think social in this ele U.S. election has been kind of the focus of the after aftermath of the election. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> Uh, so, handing over to, to Cassie to, to see if uh, there are more questions. Thanks, Javi. Uh, yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Thanks to everyone um, for your run through. Uh, so, first of all, we actually have one from Emma Bayliss. Um, and she says, What would you say to a CEO who doesn't want to bring in AI, artificial intelligence, or NLP to their business? NLP being neuro linguistic programming. Having a true insights-driven business means potentially opening data up that they might not be ready to see or deal with. So what would you say to that CEO? And it's not um, directed to anyone in particular, so if everyone wants to take some time to answer it, please do. Yeah, so I'll, maybe I'll dive in first. Uh, being the analyst, I, I can slightly be controversial in that. I'd say, well, uh, you won't be a CEO in two, three years' time. I mean, basically, I mean that's the, the honest truth. But maybe you wouldn't say that to her or his face because um, we want to keep our jobs, right? So, um, what I would do really is, um, it, it's not so much doing it. But look to let me show you, let me prove to you the value of these approaches, and really. Um, you know, as any leader of business, uh, you, your, your job is to maximize uh, or understand what is going to get you competitive advantage and look for, you know, any technique to kind of do that. So your job as the person asking that CEO is to really show them um, small iterative kind of value points as to how this, these kind of uh, machine learning, and by the way, uh, AI uh, is a multi-stack beast, right? So. NLP comes into play, neural networks, um, you know, machine learning, predictive analytics, all sorts of things come into play, the image processing, you know, uh, so your stack will be quite, you know, the ultimate AI stack is going to be a fairly complex piece, but start off small, you know, prove to her that, for instance, uh, machine learning within a behavioral targeting context within on, on, you know, for acquiring customers or converting them is working, show them. How, you know, show them the value. Look at the uplift that you can get from a simple multivariate testing, which uses machine learning and AI uh, kind of techniques, or at least part of that. And so, really, start to prove those those values. You don't need to invest heavily to kind of show that value. You can do it in a pilot, or even you might even have existing uh, capabilities there. So, for me, that's the way to 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 um, to, to really approach it. Yeah, and just adding as well something there is that I completely, I completely agree. Uh, so we have, uh, so we have seen from energy companies to uh, script writers to uh, as well Premier League 
uh, football teams, not only the, na the Danish ones, uh, to use uh, to use artificial intelligence to do uh, proof of concepts that then deliver that kind of uh, insight that they need to 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 invest heavily heavily of them. And on the top of my mind, I remember, uh, for example, Telefonica, uh, the telecom company, where they um, uh, optimize their advertising based on psychological psychological traits. Um, they um, triple the quality, uh, in this case, the quality of people that they were attracting by by that particular campaign. Um, so I think that's completely uh, through those little. Proof of concepts is what is going to uh, help you to, to invest more heavily and, and, and then make those cases to, for, for, for the CEOs. I agree with you both. Uh, and I think here at Helia, and that's a bit the dilemma, like, you know, you, um, you need to take sometimes people on a journey. It's not that you change things overnight. So um, I agree that you need to look for like a use case. Um, the best thing is before investing in technology, which a lot of um, brands that we work with, the first thing they do, they say, okay, I need to invest in the technology, but they don't have a use case. And then it's like, you know, a bit of paralysis. We don't know, we have all that great technology, but we don't know how to use it. Um, so I will, I will agree, like, you know, it's more the case of looking for like a, a use case, it can be something small. And the other thing is to reverse and say, okay, what is the risk of, no, of doing nothing about? So once you have a use case and say, look, if we don't do nothing, uh, like, you know, what is the, the risk of not doing nothing? And try to quantify that risk. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks, guys. And thanks for your question, Emma. And hopefully that answered um, for you. Uh, so I actually had a question myself and I wanted to ask, um, open to everyone. Uh, so obviously everything that we've all um, spoken about today in terms of customer insights and combining data points is the essentially the utopia of what a brand or business um, should be doing. But what would you say to someone, um, what are the three key steps to getting to that ideal point? Um, I know you explained how Stitch Fix um, and an FMCG brand are able to use this customer insight. Um, but, you know, for, for a different sector or a different brand, what would be those three key steps to building that ideal customer insight strategy? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, for me, the, the first key step is you do need leadership support here. Your leadership uh, needs to re have be in a situation where they are beyond convinced that they do realize that um, these approaches like stitching the data uh, to deliver competitive advantage is uh, the way to go. So, you know, you need a clear strategy supported by the exact first step. If you don't have that, you know, you're just going to be uh, stumbling around amongst the, you know, the weeds in the forest. Um, secondly, is not a, you know, once you have that strategy and that support, it's not a massive rush to, um, you know, invest is to look at your existing as assets, look at your existing skill sets and experiences, because, so for instance, your, you know, when it comes to searching and managing data, your marketing team might be really uh, great at it, or some other parts of the organization might be great at it. Look to them to, um, and, and these other assets that you might have in terms of technology, to start to build out these proof of concepts and you know the processes and uh, for working together and to you know expand across the the organisation and then you know lastly and if you wanted three steps but you know there's a bit few more but the perhaps top in the top three is you're not going to be able to learn to do this yourself you know not in the time frames we're talking about organic growth uh, oh. in terms of capability is not an option you do need to reach out to external. Um, agencies, external partners to really help you accelerate uh, your capability around this, this area. So I'll keep quiet, but that's, those are my three steps. Yeah, I just want to add, uh, uh, um, as, as you said, James, there are like many, many steps, and uh, to add, just to add one more there would be to have as well that clear data, data strategy, because there are so many different data sources and how they uh, plug together um, in different layers, in different levels, so could, uh, could some of them can be plugged at the individual level uh, of a, a particular customer, so they can be plugged at the aggregated or the insight model 
uh, level and and have that clear data strategy and from all the, to merge all the different data sources as well. I think is is key and yeah and completely agree to to uh, to reach experts on that sense. Um, for me, I would add uh, like you know um, well just the first step for me is like whatever is your strategy, try to put the customer at the center of everything that you do. And this is becoming like critical and it's becoming more and more common. We need to start to delivering experiences. Like it's not about selling products, it's about like giving people like a great experience, whatever is your product or your service. The second one, and I agree with James because things are moving really, really fast, um, is look for the right partner. Um, I think it's critical as well to be able to have solid partnerships like you know with people that you work with because you are not going to be by yourself doing that so you need people who you know they know what they're doing they have the right expertise and they will take you through the journey and they will help um, they will help you like you know we've been working like with brands that sometimes they find it difficult like that situation that you know their CEO is not or there is some senior parts of the business that, you know, they are not committed to that change, and um, you know, sometimes it's, it's good to have a partner that helps you to achieve that. Perfect. Thanks so much, guys. Um, thank you, everyone, for staying on. I know that we've overrun by about ten minutes, and I apologize very much. Um, but I hope you enjoyed everything today, and especially that last uh, ten minutes. It was quite insightful. So thank you so much, guys. Um, and I just want to say a big thank you to James and Nuria and Javier for joining us today as well. So, yeah, hopefully you've all learned something and thanks for joining and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much.